Have you heard the story about the author who was in a grocery store? I got there at that Kroger at around nine o'clock in the morning. He was set up with a little table selling his books, one book at a time. You know, I have one of those folding sports chairs and I was just sitting there all day and sold a few books here and there, you know. There was a lull in the store. There weren't a lot of people. I was just sitting there. I'd been there all day at that point. He just came up and asked me about the book and he said he wanted to buy a book. And he went to the uh, register and he bought it. When, uh, so I think I'm going to go ahead and get a second one. I'm going to gift it on there. But then he came back and he said he had a TikTok channel and he wanted to get a book as a giveaway on his channel. See if we can get you a little bit of love on there. Oh, okay. I won't say no. <laughs> <laughs> and he asked if I invited him if he took a video. And I'm saying, no, if it helps you. I don't, I'm, sitting, I'm not doing anything else. I'm sitting here. Why not help this guy? I was, Same thing, just sign it? Yeah, if you could just sign it and... That way it's a little bit more personal to whoever gets it. You know, he just posted it, and from there it just absolutely took off. It was crazy after that. We're talking about the crazy experience author Sean Warner is having with his debut novel, Lee Howard and the Ghosts of Simmons Pierce Manor, on this Desideratum. A desideratum is an essential thing. I'm audiobook narrator Teresa Bakken, and I think this story is full of essential things. This week, we're talking about how a small act of kindness set off a ripple effect of goodwill. You're going to hear from Sean Warner about his young adult novel about a girl and some ghosts who solve a murder mystery. You'll hear some of his favorite scenes from the audiobook, read by me for Black Rose Writing and Podium Audio. But first, let's start by getting to know Sean. Um, it's a struggle for me, even to this day. It's a you know a struggle. I mean, I I'm a lifelong learner. Your fifty cent word is I'm autodidactic. I love to teach myself stuff. I love to learn new things. But I read excruciatingly slow. I'm a very, very slow reader. Um, yeah, school uh, was not the environment that I thrived in, um, especially in high school where it's more memorization and then feeding back. And, and I'm more uh, conceptual and practice and playing with an application learner. Yeah. I remember, um, and, you know, I, I don't, typically talk about this a whole lot but I remember when I was in like I think it was like the second or third grade and I was actually hospitalized for a week for evaluation for learning disabilities and stuff like that and this was you have to remember this was the late 60s early 70s. Sean's talking about what he now knows is attention deficit disorder. While he hasn't shared much about it publicly he is very open about it. Even when I'm reading things for pleasure, for my own enjoyment now, I, I still find myself doing this where I will read a page and not have a clue what I just read, but no, I read every word on that page. But my mind was fantasizing about a character I might want to write or some other thing or thinking about you know, something else that's going on and I have to do it, you know, force myself to come back and do it all again. The military was really good for me in discipline wise. Not that I was an undisciplined kid, but I needed kind of an uber discipline, um, you know. Sean joined the army right out of high school. He served as a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne and he still thinks about his time in the service. And I still... To this day, you know, a lot of times in my brain, it's like, come on, Sarge, you got to get this done and, and, you know, break myself like I would one of my troops and, you know, force myself to do these sort of things. And I've learned skills to cope and manage. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it was um, it was not a cakewalk and it wasn't because I was stupid, but a lot of people did feel that I wasn't very bright. Um, and that was a, a struggle, too. Yes, because having that seed planted as a seven or eight-year-old, 
would shape the way you interacted probably with educators forever. It could, it could have done that, but you know, my mom and dad never treated me like that. Now they gave me a lot of other, a lot of other space to kind of explore my universe in my own terms. They let me kind of find my own path, but not once did they ever say that I wasn't very bright and never allowed me to believe that either. Wow. They were kind of ahead of their time, probably. Well, they probably, well, you know, they were my parents. They knew me. They talked to me. They knew, you know, when I was interested in what I was doing and, and the things that I was reading, because I was, I, even though it was slow, I was still reading. I was an advanced reader and a voracious reader. I remember my dad one time saying, you know, you keep me on my toes because you carry on a conversation we had last week like it was two minutes ago. And you it's like there's no break in it. (laughs) It's so, yeah, they were real supportive. And when I got to college, it was a lot easier because, first of all, I had the military discipline behind me, but also because I was allowed more and I was expected more to independently learn. So. When you read your bio and your advanced degrees and the different kind of categories of higher education that you, the span of that, no one would guess that it had ever been hard for you. So as hard and difficult as it was, I, th- there was good stuff in there too, like that perseverance and the the ability to know that I will survive through it and come out the other end and I will succeed and I'm going to be okay. (laughs) You're going to be okay. Yeah. So now you have college age kids of your own. My son just graduated college. Yeah. He's, he just graduated. My daughter is, she's transitioning from a, her bachelor's into her master's degree. Um, And don't get me started on them because I'll talk forever about them because the most remarkable part of my adventures have been being a husband and father. Yeah. You know, my wife is just an amazing human being. I call her my handler now because she, she looks after me and well, she does. She keeps me on the straight and narrow and she says, you need to do this. Have you responded to that? And, you know, and there's so much coming at me right now that I, she's just, um, if she wasn't before and she absolutely was, but even more so now she's invaluable to my life. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's very clear. I think everywhere I've heard you speak, you freely praise that relationship as being integral to who you are and your success. And oh yeah, yeah, abs- absolutely. And we just celebrated our twenty eighth year anniversary last month. Congratulations! And yeah, and it's you know twenty eight years of being head over heels. <laughs> I expect twenty eight more out of it. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. That's really great. For me too, I have the same problem with kids in that I could I could go off and talk about them a lot. Like I really am I'm super proud of them. And I know they are not my accomplishments. They came through me. They are not me, you know, but there's such a level of, of celebration for everything they achieve, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I think they are an extension. I mean, you you put the core values in them that are important to you, you know, and you raise them to view the world from, they saw how you viewed it from your perspective. So they are, in a sense, an extension. And it sounds like you're in some because I, I say this all about time that everybody loves their kids. I'm blessed enough to actually like mine. <laughs> and it sounds like you're in the same boat. <laughs> I am the older they get and the more. So my youngest is turning 21 this fall. The middle one is 23 and then the oldest is 25. And as they have become adults, I see every version of them. I look at them and I see the three-year-old. I see the toddler and I see the 11-year-old and I see the 14-year-old and I see the eight. But the version that they are becoming is, I like them so much. Mm Mm-hmm. They are great people. They are really great people. So what do your kids, what do they think or what do you want them to think about what's been happening to you with this debut novel? Um, as for what they do think, they, they um, you know, they're very proud. They're very supportive and, and they're happy for me. They're genuinely thrilled that this has happened to me. They've seen me work and 
um, and all kinds of things that see me work. Um, my wife and I both um, were very hardworking people. They grew up seeing that work ethic. Yeah. Yeah. So they're just genuinely, I think they're genuinely proud and really happy for me that I'm, I'm experiencing this success. As for what I want them, I want them to think whatever they want to think. They're, they're their own, they're their own people now. I, I, I give up. They're their own people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I can imagine they are very proud of you and excited. And you, and you really sort of have modeled the perseverance that we were just talking about. You know, you've just, mm-hmm. yeah. You've stuck to it. And so that was, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about writing, how you bring that perseverance to this chapter of your life, you know, this job, because writing is hard work. It is a job. It, it is a job. Yeah. You're exactly right. Writing is, is not an easy thing to do. Just getting from beginning to end is um, a, a chore of perseverance. Um, what people I think especially young writers need to hear and need to know that writing the book is the easy part is, you know, and it's also one of the shortest parts is writing the book. After the writing of the book comes the editing, which is horrific. (laughs) It it, it really is. I mean, you read, you read the thing and you read the thing and you reread it over and over and over until you swear up and down. If I read this one more time, I am going to be physically ill. And then you sit in a chair and you read it again. You, you know, maybe you take a break for a week or maybe you need a month. But um, so that editing process and rewriting, because, you know, that famous quote, writing is rewriting. Yes. Well, I you just mentioned, like, sometimes you have to take a break from it. And one of my one of my favorite blog posts that you wrote about had to do with that, how you had to kind of turn away from it um, and bang your head against a different wall. <laughs> When you feel like you're banging your head against the same walls, just change the walls, bang your head against a different wall for a while. And is that how Lee Howard happened for you? (laughs) Um, I have multiple projects going on at the same time, Um, whether it's the ADD we talked about earlier or or it's just human nature. It's just my personality. But yeah, I change. I have three or four projects going on at all times. But it's funny. Um, you asked about Lee because I was actually working on a completely different story and Lee popped into my head, you know, hi, I'm here. And okay. Oh, oh, by the way, my parents have died. She wouldn't go away. Oh, by the way, my parents have died. Yeah. Great. Let me get back to this. Hi, it's me again. (laughs) Um, You know, I'm living in this house now and it's haunted. (laughs) You know, <laughs> and these little things just keep coming up and coming up. So Lee turned into that jingle or a song that you can't get out of your head and you just kind of have to sing it or to get out of your head. Well, I had to write Lee to get it out of my head so I could go back to the other one when I was working on. And it turns out it was a good thing I did. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's and I think that's part also of this craft that it's hard to it's hard to pin down. You know, you write and you practice and there are there's nuts and bolts in the craft, but there's also there's also this layer of something hard to define. Well, it, the, you know, if you were a painter, you would have um, your different types of brushes making different kinds of strokes and different kinds of mixtures of oils and, and, and different colors and, you know, medium on the canvas and big brush strokes and little curly strokes for clouds and all the technique stuff. But to put it all together into a scene and an image on a canvas, that that is an art. There is that creativity, artistic piece to it. But they all rest on a foundation of skills, facts, and knowledge. You know, painting, drawing, um, sculpture. You know, Michelangelo could envision these beautiful sculptures, and he saw it in the stone to be released, he once said. Yes, and it's this magical collision of knowing the skill set and then having just the right idea. Mm-hmm. Just the right hocus pocus. She showed up in my mind and said, hey, hey. Yeah. 
And then the, the what if questions. Well, what if she goes to live in this manner? What if she makes friends with the ghost? Well, what if that has multiple personalities? And then, oh, okay, then not, I think this has got enough steam for a, a full book. Yeah, let's let's go. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Well, so when she first showed up to you, did you know this was YA? Did you know you were going to fit into this category of story? Or do you kind of resist being in a category? Um, no, I, I actually enjoy writing YA stuff for whatever reason. Um, I, you know, when I was a, a therapist, I worked with um, young people in a pediatric setting um, and they're just so vibrant. And, yeah. um, and it may be a combination of that. The fact that I struggled in my own childhood and that as an adult, I tend to is probably horrible and I need to work on it, but I think I hold adults to a little bit higher standard. Well, I, I let my kids kind of, yeah, you messed up. Let's talk about it. But, you know, as opposed to you messed up, here's the consequences. <laughs> so I'm a little bit more patient with young people in my life. <laughs> so I write about them. Yes. That you, that you're attracted to that genre Mm -hmm. that that's also your audience you're writing for those people too i i, I am and, and there is a deeper part of that too um in that i wrote lee howard and in, in all my books i write um to be enjoyed in reading and i think we've turned reading into a chore it's what we do as as a kind of a work or part of um, something we have to do instead of something that we want to do. So, I mean, you've read the book. It's, it's fun. It, it's a, it's a very quick, fun read. It's an adventure. Yeah. It's an adventure. It is an adventure. Reading should be fun. Yeah. I know when I was a kid, it was a, I love to read. It was pure escapism. It took me out of my world for a little bit. And it doesn't matter what I was reading. I was reading like Conan the Barbarian, Tarzan of the Apes, Marvel, DC Comics, things like that. I, I was reading for fun. Yeah, so you you want your audience to be attracted to reading and you want them to experience adventure and fun. I also think, I think you give Lee some very real and some very deep emotions. Like you have self-harm when we open to the knowledge of that, of what's going on with her. Well, yeah, characters are um, people with feelings and flaws and aspirations. I, I try to write as realistically as possible in very unrealistic circumstances. So Lee and, and having this friend who was a ghost and with multiple personalities and, and, you know, the whole murder mystery thing is very outlandish. And I get that. But if you write it realistically and you, like you said, she has feelings and emotions. She is coping with an awful lot of stuff, you know, and she comes out of it. Okay. At the end, she perseveres. Yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the book. There are scenes with ghosts. Uh, I, I like the scene where she's climbing out the window and um, Bodhi's kind of teasing her about being afraid. And I think you're just afraid to climb out. That's why you're trying to start an argument with me. Her jaw dropped open. A little brat was daring her to do it. She clenched her teeth in determination. Reaching out the window, she grabbed a handful of ivy and gave it a firm tug. To her surprise, the tendrils nearest the wall were as big around as screwdriver handles. Repositioning her hand to get more of those and less of the thin vines on the outer edge, she tugged harder. The vines held. Sucking in a deep breath, she swung herself up and out the window to stand on its sill while clinching the vines so tight they dug into her flesh. There, she said to Bodhi, now where do I need to go? Down, obviously, and keep to the right so you aren't trapped by the next window. Lee kicked hard to get her foot deep into the thick tangle of vines. Once her full weight was on them and not on the windowsill, the growth sagged, 
making her whimper in fear, which in turn filled her with shame. It'll hold, Bodhi reassured her. I told you, I used to do this all the time. She began to climb down. This better not be how you died. You know, and she's like, oh, the little brat's daring me to do it. Well, I got to do it now, <laughs> kind of thing, you know, which, you know, she's she's still a teen. She's, you know, it's like, OK, I'm being peer pressured by a ghost, but it's still peer pressure and I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, little Bodhi is, is he's tender at some times and he's kind of a callous, you know, clueless kid at others. Big Bodie is a kind of a mean, bitter old man. Big Bodie's laughter cackled again as his head, trailed by a hideous purple plume of smoke, soared in crazy circles around the room. When you're done showing off, maybe you could explain it to me, she groaned. Oh, we are in a snit today, he said, disappearing from the air and reappearing in a chair across from her. I don't think I found either of those particularly hard after I had the personality set in my mind. Okay, how would Lee act in this moment? Or how would Myra respond to this? Myra's very down to earth and she just meets people on their terms, not her terms, which is a beautiful way to be. (laughs) Yes, and I'm really glad you brought her up. So you... Lee is our main character, and she's dealt with a huge trauma. Her parents have been murdered, and she's on this sort of journey to try to solve that. And she's living, she ends up living in a house with a cousin who's really very close in age. Mm -hmm. Just a few years older, yeah. Yes. You write Myra in a way that she doesn't feel sorry for Lee. She doesn't, or she doesn't, um, I don't know, she just lets her be. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I thought that relationship between two girls around the same age was was really lovely. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, Myra is um, like I said, she's not judgmental at all. She doesn't come to relationships and things with her expectations on them. Well, she looks at them and sees them as they are, and just kind of accepts them and doesn't try to change them. And and I hope this comes through because that's how I wanted it to come through. It's because she is so confident in herself. And once we have that confidence in ourselves, like she does, you know, she's not threatened by anybody because she knows who she is. Mm. And so that makes it a lot easier to be accepting of others when you don't see them as a threat or an intimidation or a worry to you. Yes. That's a really great way to explain it. And I think you do that through Lee. We hear Lee say several times about how interactions with Myra just help her feel seen and understood. And um, they grow very close through the story. Yeah. Yeah. They, they develop a sisterhood relationship. And those relationships have always been very important to me and my friends. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I put that level of love and commitment between two people in a book. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you did a great job with it. Let's talk about motorcycles. You give Lee this motorcycle. She's even in your cover art. She's on the motorcycle. Yeah. If I could, if I were to own a motorcycle, it would probably be that one. (laughs) You write one scene in particular where she she experiences sort of a rush of adrenaline and freedom and on the motorcycle and yeah because her dad taught her to ride and that was their thing they rode motorcycles together and you know every time she rides it's reliving his gift to her so yeah it's a very freeing and exhilarating experience for her it's very personal to ride for her. The first curve came up so fast she wasn't prepared for it. Swearing, she heaved the bike over into a drastic lean, struggling to keep the tires on the road. Regaining control, she slid over to the other side of the seat to take the second curve, her knees so close to the pavement she thought she could feel it passing beneath. Beside her, little Bodie was keeping pace, running faster than any living person could. 
His face glowed with unbridled joy as the trees and pavement blew by. Another set of twists and turns was coming up. She could see Bodhi laughing beside her, but the sound of his mirth was inside her helmet and kept her company all the way to the guard shack. As she roared toward it, he began falling back. He was going to let her win. Guess you are a gentleman, she said. Of course I am, his voice ringing with glee said inside her helmet. What I liked about the relationships with the ghosts was that they they experience a kind of healing in relationship with Lee, and she experiences a kind of healing in relationship with them. And I thought that was a really unexpected thing in a ghost story. Um, well, I think that's just a reflection of of life in general. You know, we we help each other through it, and that's that's just the bottom line. And you know, we all help each other through it. I mean, in my story, not Lee Howard, but how the book got so famous. I mean, Red helped me, and he didn't even know it was happening or what was going on. It was just he was just being so kind, just talking to a stranger. Yeah. So tell me, explain a little bit what where you were and what you were doing. You were in a Kroger. I was at Kroger. Kroger has a program called um, Authors in the Grocery Store. You know, it's a good way to get your name out there because that's the hardest part of being a debut author is letting the world know that you exist and you have a book. Yeah, so you would you would just pack up some books and a card table. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and a little display, set up a little display and sit at Kroger all day. When did you piece together what had happened? Because you must have just packed up your table at the end of the day and headed home. And Yeah. I packed up my table. Then I'm going to be honest with you. I wasn't even thinking about that because earlier, about two hours before Red showed up, a guy showed up who was a representative of the federal women's correctional facility locally to me and said, you know what? We got a lot of women who want to learn to write and want to do something like that. Would you mind coming and giving a, a seminar, a little class on writing? I said, Absolutely. I would love to do that. So I was thinking more about that. And this was on Saturday. And then Sunday, my wife and I were sitting watching TV. I guess uh, Red posted the video on Sunday at some point, Sunday morning. And then Sunday evening, our phone started ringing with notifications that my website was getting traffic. And so both our phones started going off. And then it turned, eventually we had to turn the TV off and try to figure out what is going on. Then my daughter calls from college and she's like, Mom, Dad's going viral on TikTok. <laughs> and I'm, I, I'm, I'm not a young person, so I'm sitting there. Oh, really? Is that good? <laughs> you know, I didn't know. It turns out it is good. It's very good. And and it just just grew and grew and it kept on growing and and I probably never will fully get my head wrapped around <laughs> you know, the the numbers and, and everything else. All I know is people are being just very, very nice to me. Yeah. And I think, you know, when I saw you do some interviews on the national stage about this, I was most impressed or I, I don't know what made the biggest impression on me was how you kept bringing it back to an act of kindness. You thought, oh, I'll do that nice thing for him. I'll do a video with him. And he was thinking, I'll do this nice thing for you. And and that sincerity uh, somehow touched a nerve, even through the screen for people. And they felt it. Yeah, well, I think that's how, you know, kindness works. You know, laughter, kindness, it really is transformative. And it's so small. I, I remember um, I held the door open for uh, a boy and as we were leaving a, a building and I just held the door open and he said, thank you. I just said, yes, sir. And he brightened up this little kid. He's like maybe eight, 10, something like that. And here's his old man saying, calling him, sir. 
And I don't know, maybe it's wishful thing. I don't know, but maybe somewhere in the future, he will be more inclined to be respectful to somebody else because he knows how good it feels to be treated with respect by a stranger. These little ripples, little tiny ripples that you know, just go out into wherever they go and, and they leave an effect. So no, no act of kindness is too small. And, and the great thing is, you know, for the rest of my writing career, but for the rest of my career, I get the privilege of saying that I owe it all to an act of kindness. So that, that's, uh, that's pretty amazing to me. It is. That's a real gift. Well, I, the last question I always like to ask storytellers who come on the Desert Erotum podcast has to do with the name Desert Erotum. Mm -hmm. Which when I was growing up, my parents had a poem that they hung on the wall called Desert Arada, lots of life lessons. And so when I was thinking about adding to the podcast space or adding to the storyteller space, it made sense to me to sort of anchor into that, that poem and those ideas. And so I like to ask for you, if someone said to you, what, Sean, what is most essential? What would you say? Um, I think the most essential thing is to identify your your ideal of good character. People, I don't think, spend enough time sit down and actually introspect on what is a good person and am I a good person? And what would it mean to have good character? Mm. So I, I think that's the most important thing is, you know, um, in, in religion that may be becoming Christ-like or Buddha-like or, or whatever. Or if there's somebody, person, you know, who's just an amazing human being, strive to be that, you know, and cultivate that in yourself. Because everything you touch after that is going to be colored and infected with that person that you bring to it. And if you bring a mean, nasty person like Big Bodie, that's what you're going to get in life. If you bring openness, honesty, genuineness, um, because, you know, people make a big deal. What's the, what's the key to happiness? And it's really pretty simple. And it's your happiness is proportional to your service to others. And so that's what I would say is just cultivate a good character within yourself, no matter what you do, because success will follow out of that, because people want to be surrounded by others of good character. I hope you enjoyed getting to know Sean Warner as much as I did. Recording the audiobook for Lee Howard and the Ghosts of Simmons Pierce Manor as the excitement around it soared was really a thrill. I want to thank Sean, Black Rose Writing, and Podium Audio for putting me on the team. And as always, thank you for listening. <laughs>